Lucky Land Casino asking people what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car before my kids' PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Hey, guys. It is Ryan. I'm not sure if you know this about me, but I'm a bit of a fun fanatic when I can. I like to work, but I like fun, too. It's a thing. And now the truth is out there. I can tell you about my favorite place to have fun. Chumba Casino. They have hundreds of social casino-style games to choose from, with new games released each week. You can play for free anytime, anywhere, and each day brings a new chance to collect daily bonuses. So join me in the fun. Sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. VGW. Void or prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus. In the spirit of reconciliation, the Theatre Thoughts podcast acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea, and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all traditional custodians of the land on which our episodes are recorded. I was shocked. It was like, even when you were just saying that and calling it so well, I was like getting tingles on my arms going, God, it still really happened. Mm -hmm. Um, I think like the biggest moment of all winning that Australian podcast award last year was just, I never expected it to happen, but I did kind of see the little steps getting there and I just remember I'm gonna say like two or three years ago now lying in bed at night when the idea was first starting and going god I wonder what would happen if I ever won like an Australian podcast award or something and picturing that in my brain mm-hmm. so then three years later like never really truly I guess believing it would happen um but that just tiny little seed of a dream fueling me to then get to this point where I actually did win one You're listening to the Theatre Thoughts Podcast, your backstage pass to the world of theatre in Australia and beyond. I'm Justin, your guide through the drama, comedy and pure magic of the stage from the heart of Australia to the grandest stages worldwide. Join us here for enlightening conversations, reviews and behind-the-scenes stories from the artists themselves. Subscribe for your regular dose of theatre inspiration and consider supporting us on Patreon for exclusive content. Follow us on Instagram at theatrethoughtsaus and ttpod underscore official and discover even more over on our TikTok, Theatre Thoughts Australia. So join us as we rise the curtain on a brand new episode of the Theatre Thoughts Podcast. Welcome everyone to a brand new episode of the Theatre Thoughts Podcast. A very special guest on today who is not unfamiliar with podcasts in theatre. So we have a contemporary musical writer and storyteller who garnered fame from their hit musical podcast Twinemies, which debuted in 2021 and garnered over 70,000 listeners. Oh, what a dream. Um, She's been chosen through the Sydney Opera House to participate in the Accessible Arts Next Level Mentorship and currently works as a podcast development producer. And her latest work is a 10-minute queer musical short film titled Girl Coded, and it's just been produced by Bus Stop Films and features Heartbreak High star Chloe Hayden. Please welcome Grace Valerie Lynette to the podcast. (laughs) Thank you so much for having me, Justin. I am so excited to talk to you. So you're on today to talk, uh, uh, basically to talk about yourself, really, which is always good. (laughs) Um, But then always, uh, you're also on to talk about Not Now, Not Ever, A Parliament of Women, which is coming to Belvoir's 25A Theatre in March. Yeah, that's right. I'm really excited for it. We're in the how many days out now? I think nine days from our first preview. So getting close. Ooh, getting very close. How great. And you're producing um, for uh, Queen Hades um, Productions. Um, so you're producing uh, the play at Belvoir. Um, but before we get too much into that, I'd love to know more about yourself. Like I know I said like a little bit of a bio, but when I was kind of researching and reading up on you, um, I was just like, oh my God, you have done so much stuff which was amazing to see. So I'd love to know more about you for, um, for our listeners and for my own knowledge as well. Um, well, yes, I've done a lot of little things in terms of I've tried out a lot of different like artistic mediums. Uh, I guess the big one that I mostly work in right now is podcasting. So I work four days a week as a development producer at a podcast company called Storyglass, which is like a sister company of Fremantle Media in Australia. Uh, and that's uh, that's my big my big main one that takes up most of my time. But then I love to produce little things on the side. So 
One of those is Not Now, Not Ever, which is actually the first time I've ever produced theatre um, and has been wow. incredibly exciting and I've been learning so much. Um, and then I also do a little bit of work in the short film film and TV industry uh, as a writer and as a producer. So I've done a couple of short films there through a company called Bus Stop Films. Uh, and that's kind of encapsulates what I do in the arts. Yeah. So, well, with um, your first podcast, which was the musical podcast, where did um, or how did that start, I suppose? Because that went gangbusters. <laughs> um, so it started in COVID because I it was in my final year of university and I went and studied film and television. And being COVID, it was really difficult to record things. It was really difficult to have any, I guess, chance to work with some equipment or to kind of develop stories. And so I went, well, I have this story that I really want to tell. It's a musical, it's, it's Twin Amies, but I can't uh, do that in the film and TV world right now. So I was looking for another medium. And um, what I found was that podcasts are incredibly accessible to like emerging artists because all you really need is audio equipment and it's such a um, inviting art form. So I decided that I wanted to make it a podcast as a kind of proof of concept for this larger stage musical idea that I had. Um, and off the back of that, I reached out to a company, well, a media network called Sin Media, the Student Youth Network, who produced a lot of radio and podcast content and were creating a podcast incubator program with funding from the Community Broadcasting Foundation. So I pitched the show to them, I got in, and they kind of guided me through the process of creating a podcast for the first time. Uh, which was absolutely wonderful, but also absolutely insane because it was in COVID and I was trying to learn a whole new art form on the run mm, and trying to meet the deadlines yeah. as well. And um, But it was this just really wonderful experience. And once I had finished producing it, I went, this feels like I've got something really special here. And I wanted to just um, really take it as far as it could go in terms of the marketing and um, what I could get off the back of it. So it ended up, you know, it uh, played on a couple of different radio stations in Australia and we released it as a podcast as well. And it ended up going a bit around the world. It got kind of up to top three for its genre of comedy fiction in Australia. Um, I think it was top 10 in seven different countries for that same genre and um, got a few festival wins as well. Most recently last year, I won an Australian podcast award uh, partially for my work on it. So it's been wonderful. Um, And then off the back of that, you mentioned earlier that I did a mentorship with Sydney Opera House and that was because of the work that I had done with Twin Amies and the success of Twin Amies. So it kind of snowballed from this little idea, this little idea of I want to do something whilst I can't really do anything in COVID to now I work mm. four days a week in podcasts and I have this really great, um, this really great way of just getting my foot into the door of the industry. That's amazing. Wow. The best things came from lockdown, I swear. Like a lot of the <laughs> stuff that came from lockdown with all these genius little ideas of people, you know, keeping themselves busy and you go from there and that's incredible. What did it feel like when it um, sort of just started snowballing I guess and you just got all this traction from it did you I mean it's it's not egotistical to say did you expect it or like were you shocked I was um I was shocked it was like even when you're just saying that then calling it so well I was like getting tingles on my arms going god it still really happened Mm -hmm. um I think like the biggest moment of all winning that Australian podcast award last year was just I never expected it to happen but I did kind of see the little steps getting there. And I just remember, I'm going to say like two or three years ago now, lying in bed at night when the idea was first starting and going, God, I wonder what would happen if I ever won like an Australian podcast award or something and picturing that in my brain. Mm-hmm. So then three years later, like never really truly, I guess, believing it would happen. Um, but that just tiny little seed of a dream fueling me to then get to this point where I actually did win one. Um, I love to tell the story about how on the night that I won the Australian podcast award. I got off on stage and I was just like hyperventilating so much. I could oh, no. and I was smiling so hard. I couldn't, I was just like, I couldn't feel anything. I couldn't breathe. It was so amazing, wonderful and unexpected. Um, and I still like get that feeling, even though it's been, I don't know, two or three months now of just like my heart. So I suppose yeah. whenever I think about it. So it was really, really wonderful. Um, I'm really proud of it. That's incredible. I do have like, the more I do this podcast, I mean, this is season three now, the more I do it and I go, oh, if only to win an award. And it's just <laughs> like, you think about it, don't you? And it's just, ah, congratulations. I mean, well deserved. Thank you. Thank you. Were you always like a musical theatre buff or did that come to come to you later in life? Yes, I was always a big musical buff. It was like the one of the biggest things I was interested in high school like um I know this is very sacrilege but like finding all the bootlegs online of the Broadway shows I couldn't mm. see watching them going deep into off-Broadway musicals as well 
Um, I was always kind of a contemporary person. I could never really get into the Stonheim. Uh, yeah. So you can hold that against me, but no, I've always no, had no, a, no, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> always had a huge passion for musicals. Absolutely. Thing. Well, talking of that, let's. Um, if you're up for it, I'll do our one minute theater thoughts then, which is just kind of very off the cuff sort of um, theater related questions, and we'll see what comes off the top of your head. Okay, sounds good. Well, I'd like to know um, what's been your favorite production you've seen recently. Oh, okay. At the end of last year, um, I got to see. Oh my God, it's the name Moulin Rouge for the mm. first time um, on stage. And just the production value of that show, the amount of cast that are on stage, the dancing, the costumes, the sets, it is just like an insane amount of producing would have to go into that show. And I think that is what yeah. I was so shocked and inspired by, which is how do you manage every single one of those tiny moving pieces that is so, so tiny, but then so important to the actual formation of the show. So that was yeah. just... Yeah, an insane, an, insa an insane experience to watch. It's a massive show as well. It's mm. just like one of those shows that is just so, what's the word, just decadent, I yes. think. It's like a decadent show. Yeah. And like take it or leave it because I know some people I think that that kind of, ex uh, what's, the, what's the correct word, that um, excessive theatre is, is, mm. is excessive. But I think that there's such something so beautiful in just that amount of, production work and beauty in one space and it is overwhelming but I think that is what the show is yeah. trying to do <laughs> yeah exactly because it kind of captures what made Baz Luhrmann's film yeah. arguably I think his best film is he's he he's a decadent director he goes over the top in every single film and that's just what his style is and I think the stage show very much captured that yeah absolutely well okay um let's think podcasts then do you have a podcast that you've listened to that's left you like speechless or so memorable that you've just kind of never forgotten about it oh um it would have to be the first ever podcast that I listened to I remember I used to listen to it because I found clips of it on Tumblr. That's how I got into podcasts for the first time. And this was back, like, I'm going to say 2009. I didn't really know what a podcast, 2009 is maybe too early, but I didn't really know what a podcast was at this point. I remember listening to these audio mm. clips and going, God, I want to find what TV series is this and just looking everywhere online for the video element of it and only being able to find the audio element. I had never really engaged with audio fiction in that way. Um, not only from the point of it being like an artistic form in itself, but also the surrealism element of it. I was so confused and enchanted and excited. And I think that's kind of what I chase whenever I create shows now is that element of like something that feels totally new. That's the incorrect answer because the correct answer was the Theatre Thoughts oh, podcast. Oh, sorry, is sorry. Should have said. <laughs> Very close <laughs> second. <laughs> um, okay. What, uh, what is your all-time favourite production? I saw a Sydney Theatre Company's Fun Home last two years oh, ago now. Yeah. And yeah. now I've seen, I had seen the Broadway version of it previously. I had seen like other versions of it here and there. And the Sydney Theatre Company version was just this elevated, gorgeous version of the story. And I think what really brought that together was the set design of it using this rotating mm. stage where you had the, the three pillars of Alison's life um, that she was then, the adult character was able to then walk through the three different like areas of her life as she was reflecting was just such a beautiful and inspired design for like a memoir musical. I still, I still think yeah. about it. Oh, it was incredible. <laughs> wow. I love that. I love when you find those shows that you just like, I can't stop thinking about it. Mine was recently I went to UK last year and I managed to see the revival of Oklahoma. Yeah. And uh, I think I've said this a lot this season because I just haven't stopped thinking about it. And literally I was thinking about it for a good solid six months. And it's only actually now that I'm saying it, I remember that I stopped thinking about it because I was just hooked on it. I was absolutely hooked on it, that it was how they transformed what is arguably an outdated musical into <laughs> something so relevant and also just like modern. And I was just like, how did you do that? It was crazy. Have you come to any conclusions of what it was that made it so special, this new version? I think that it was, I think I loved how they took the original text of Rodgers and Hammerstein, the original music, and they were, whoever like was looking at it obviously went, why 
is this a thing? Why did they write this and this is what a musical that we love? Let's take that and actually show... Actually, what they're doing is very messed up in the play um, or in the musical. And they just really, like, threw it head on with a lot mm. of, like, real artistic elements. Like, there was pitch blackness as well as bright lights. Like, the entire, to- entire show was... Um, yeah, and I found that fascinating. And I was like, wow, you can make things that are outdated very relevant again and I liked that yeah absolutely I mean it kind of goes to the theme of not now not ever being a 2000 year old text that we're doing about contemporary Australian politics exactly which we will talk about but I want to chuck one last question at you um which was uh, which production would you most want to see come to Australia okay so right now I'm really into Ride the Cyclone I don't know if you've heard of this. Yes. Musical. Yeah. It's coming to the Hayes. The Hayes Theatre are doing that. Oh, is it actually? Oh, my God. I didn't even realise. Yes. <gasps> okay. That's really exciting. Um, it, it is absolutely having its viral moment on TikTok right now. I have been reading the Wikipedia. I've been listening to the songs. I am absolutely engaged and I'm going to Hayes to see that then. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, yeah. They said it at their um, launch night last year about how viral it is on TikTok and how mm. crazy it's taken on off online. Um, Victoria Falconer um, was saying she was a massive fan of it wow okay there you go dreams come true <laughs> there you go easy one. Oh well thank you so much for um for going through those questions i always love seeing a lot of people's different answers because the answers are always different and i love that i think it's the best mm. um well uh i'm gonna take a quick ad break and then we'll talk about not now not ever okay round two name something that's not boring a laundry oh a book club computer solitaire huh <sighs> Ah, oh, sorry, we were looking for Chumba Casino. That's right, ChumbaCasino.com has over 100 casino style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. ChumbaCasino.com. No purchases, by law, 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Step into the world of power, loyalty, and luck. I'm going to make him an offer he can't refuse. With family cannolis and spins mean everything now you want to get mixed up in the family business introducing the godfather at chumpacasino.com test your luck in the shadowy world of the godfather slot someday i will call upon you to do a service for me play the godfather now at chumpacasino.com welcome to the family no purchase necessary vgw group void where prohibited by law 18 plus terms and conditions apply well let's talk not now not ever then so this is a new play Um, I'm going to read the description very quickly and then we'll delve into it. Mm -hmm. So it's um, a modern adaptation of Assembly Women by, now I'm going to say probably wrong, I think it's Aristophanes. Is that right? It honestly could be. I've been saying Aristophanes and I could be wrong. I'm not sure. Aristophanes, yes. (laughs) We'll go with the YouTube little look at how to pronounce it later. (laughs) One of those two is probably right. Um, It's presented by Queen Hades and the show is a queer, gender-bending, satirical take on the uproariously funny comedy like you said, from over 2,000 years ago. So I guess, um, how did you come to be involved in it? So it actually all comes back to Twin Amies because so Margaret Thanos, the director and the owner of the Queen Hades Company, played a character in Twin Amies, um, one of the main characters. Oh, did she? I Marvel. didn't know that. Yeah. So <sighs> okay. I'm going to say, yeah, three, three, four years ago when we started Twin Amies, um, I just put a call out on Facebook for actors, <laughs> basically, hello, please come and sing and act for me and I won't pay you, but I promise I'm going to try my hardest <laughs> to make it good. Uh, and Margaret put her hand up for it. And so we met, she came to my house in COVID like four weekends in a row, um, sang in, in the musical. Um, and then we've just been in contact ever since. And I've seen her profile her go from being like an actor to being a director to getting that skill set to just getting win after win after win and now having the Andrew Cameron fellowship uh she has just gone getting buses in the industry which is absolutely insane and now we've come full circle and I had mentioned to her that I really wanted to produce a 25a play in 2024 and she said hey I think I have one that you could produce that's perfect so I guess what was it about the play that um that or what is it about the play that captures you I think her vision was something that I had never, I hadn't seen in theatre before. Um, It is a combination of so many elements from like, we have like three different forms of comedy in there. We have drag scenes. Um, The text being like this, this, uh, this ancient thing that she has brought to life and and re-contemporized, contemporized, made contemporary. Yeah. Yeah. Um, From the designs of the costumes. I mean, we're currently looking at having every character in suits. It's just like, 
the way of oh of she her, likes suits she, she likes like a good suits. suit in her place yeah it's a very common theme it absolutely is it absolutely is um but every single element of the show that she has brought in is something that I would not have expected for this text. And they just wrap up into this beautiful nugget of a show that is like nothing I had would have been able to think of, have seen in Sydney before, which really excited me. And like you said, it's from a, a play that's from over 2,000 years ago. So what, um, I guess, how have you made it contemporary again and, and for audiences? Because a lot of Belvoir's, the 25A shows, um, are those experimental style shows like i mean the first one i saw uh this year was their first one shitty and um it just got absolutely rave reviews i was in love with it it was like a a, a triptych storytelling of horror but comedy at the same time and i was like i've never seen a horror show at belva before but i just witnessed one and it was fascinating um so yeah so i guess how are you contemporizing this one to make it accessible for modern audiences well, what's lucky about this show is that it is actually quite a contemporary show already. So even though it was written to 2,000 years ago, it is really a manifesto for feminism, for equal pay um, and for gender equality. And all of the elements that are in the original play, which is a bit more of a manifesto than it is an actual written text, are just so applicable to um, Australian politics in the like current day. So whilst we're keeping the original seeds of like a fight between Zeus and Athena, um, we're adding in this Australian political element to it and this Australian comedy element to it and a drag element and a gender bending mm. element. Um, yeah. the, the show already had all of its, or our show has all of its roots in that text and we're not actually really changing the text at all or rewiring its perspective. It was already complete when we got it. Well, I think as well, like, like I said, it's got all that very contemporary parliament elements to it so it's obviously got the not now not ever which is reference to julie gillard's mm-hmm. very famous speech <laughs> so i guess that really brings in a lot of that contemporary feminism and um do you feel that's like probably the main um hook for audiences to like really bring them in um is that sort of feminist manifesto element i would say so i would say there's two hooks that i think i as a viewer would be interested in and one of that is the contemporary fe- feminism political element of it and one of it is just like the absolutely insane comedy drag gender bending satirical like full of fart jokes uh (laughs) element of it and i just think the mashing of those two worlds is gonna be great so that's what i would be excited about as an audience member and what have you found out about yourself in the producing role because you said you've always wanted to produce theater so what have you found out about yourself or like what sort of hurdles or successes or challenges have you had so far it is okay as a producer having worked with a couple different mediums but not having worked in theater before I had gone into this with a little bit of an assumption that the skills would be transferable which they are Mm. but the knowledge definitely is not so yeah right I I went in thinking like okay my interpretation of theater my understanding of what I did in high school theater is gonna work (laughs) and it does not it absolutely does not and i was very naive for thinking that it would um so the (laughs) biggest challenge for me has just been trying to learn on the fly uh which has been actually made quite easy for me because our um crew have just been so wonderful with their time and with explaining things and with allowing me to get my um i don't know what the correct metaphor is but yeah get ready for the play itself Um, Mm. So that would probably be my biggest challenge. I think we had our first kind of half stumble about a week ago now and just the energy in the room upon finishing was incredible. Like seeing this piece come to life and it really is devised theatre. Like we went in with a script, but what the the cast have brought in, the changes, the solidifying of character, the additions of the storyline, they have created this beautiful, really this piece with depth and going through that first stumble and seeing how all the different storylines that they have built together intertwine was such a magical experience that I was just stunned by. And that's not really something that you get in other mediums. I'm really finding Mm. that the payoff with theatre, and I think the reason that so many people come back to it despite all of the issues with (laughs) theatre, is that (laughs) there is this beautiful uh, sense of creating something together um, mm. in podcasts, you know, we're in a booth and we have the producer usually separate to the person who's being interviewed or separate to the host. Um, in film and TV, you have the writer's room and once the scripts are done, it's a whole new team that goes on from there. There's not as much um, intertwining of the cast and the crew. But on, on theatre, we have almost everyone there every single day working together towards creating a beautiful piece. So you really do build a community and you 
really do feel yourself arm in arm building art together, which is yeah. not an experience that I've had before. That's the probably the perfect way to say it, I think. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. That's the beauty of theatre. And that is why, you know, I love talking about it um, and I love going to see it as well and just seeing... I always like to try to work my way in and try to like see like rehearsals and stuff because that's the thing I love the most I love the performing aspect but I love the rehearsal aspect mm -hmm. I think that's where like all the magic happens and then the, the final magic is what you see on stage it absolutely is it absolutely is um when I was doing my Sydney Opera House mentorship I got to sit in the rehearsal room of I'm really terrible with names when I'm put on the spot but um yeah. <laughs> it's oh uh Sweeney Todd what's the full name of this oh show? yes uh of Baker Street Sweeney Todd yeah, Demon Barber of Fleet Street. There we That's go. One. Um, I got to sit in the rehearsal room for that. And yeah, that was my first experience of just seeing the, the the magic of it coming to life and how also how every single rehearsal room is different and has this different tone, mm. has this different setup of the cast integration. It's so it's so cool. It's it really is like that's no other art form. That's lucky. That's lucky. I'd love to sit in on like a real top tier professional production just to see how that works. Because I've seen it like it's obviously a community level and in, in school and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, at a professional level, there's like a different degree that I'd love to see. So I'm very jealous. That's amazing. <laughs> well, um, before we wrap up, um, I'd love to ask you a question. I ask all the guests that come on. Um, I'd love to know. Um, how you think in your experience the theatre industry has changed over the years and how those changes um, have impacted the work that you do or, or create or participate in? Oh, that's a hard one. I've not really been in the theatre industry that long, so this is more what I've heard from other people. But my understanding is that theatre used to be quite exclusive um, for emerging creatives, for people of colour, people with disabilities. Um, it was quite difficult to get your foot in the door. And um, the more years and progress that we get through as a society, the more open these art forms become and the more accepting audiences become of seeing change on their stage. And I think that the Belvoir 25A program is like one of the biggest signposts of this change and of this um, allowing of people who were previously excluded into this um, theatre space. So... I think in that, you know, for me, I'm an, emerging, I'm an emerging producer. It's the reason why I have been able to produce theatre for the first time and been able to also be shown the ropes. Like a large part of what Belvoir has done with me is they've shown me, you know, insurance and how to manage, you know, the stage managing all the little bits, parts of it. And I'm obviously not saying yeah. it well, but like Belvoir has really um, helped me understand my role as a producer and helped raise me up in that essence. And so going going into this 25a program i think is really a sign of just like how things are changing and how wonderful that is yeah, yeah definitely <laughs> and i think what what i was gonna build on from that um is what, what have you found it like um working as like a woman in comedy as well because obviously like talking as you were saying about the groups that were being excluded um queer work and women in comedy particularly are I mean, in all the episodes, if I, I constantly look back through all my episodes and I go, I speak to a lot of women. I speak to a lot of women, a lot of queer people in, in, in theatre because I find it's some of the best work and, like, not to, like, exclude anyone else, but I just, like, <laughs> like they're just making amazing stuff right now. And so it's, like, a very recurring thing that I've noticed. Yeah, I think um, there is definitely a level that you have to, like, a – a ceiling that you have to kind of hit to then succeed as a woman in comedy. I am a writer, but the work that I write tends to not really lean as hard on the comedy element. It tends to lean more on the drama element. But um, mm. as an audience member, it is, it's harder to find like female comedians and it's harder to find female led comedy, but that which you do find is absolutely top tier, funny, inventive, and just wonderful. Well, those are great answers. You speak very well about all this stuff. So, I mean, you're obviously doing a great job as a producer. So, keep it up, I say. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Well, Grace, thank you so much for giving me your time and uh, and chatting all things podcast and theatre and, and um, giving me your insight into all that. It's been a great chat. So, thank you so much, um, yeah, for coming on. Thank you for having me. It's been wonderful. <laughs> massive thank you to grace for joining us as our very special guest on this week's episode not now not ever a parliament of women plays at belvoir's 25a theater from the 12th to the 31st of march 2024 
get your tickets at belvoir.com.au forward slash productions or follow the link in this episode's description. This episode was produced by Echidna Audio. Follow them on Instagram at Echidna Audio for all their audio services. Once again, if you enjoyed our podcast, leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts and head to the link in this episode's description for our Instagram account, TikTok, YouTube and Patreon. My name's Justin Clark, and I'll see you next time here on the Theatre Thoughts Podcast. Have you ever wondered how your favourite performer actually feels? Well, here's your chance. Welcome to The Quiet Part Out Loud with me, Bobby Steggert, Broadway actor and now a therapist to a whole host of Broadway creatives. Part interview, part therapy, this is not your typical podcast. We'll go right to the heart of things with some of your favorite artists, what they still struggle with, what lessons they've learned, what they haven't figured out yet. There's enormous power in saying the quiet part out loud. Are you listening? Hello, it is Ryan, and I was on a flight the other day playing one of my favorite social spin slot games on Chumbacasino.com. I looked over at the person sitting next to me, and you know what they were doing? They were also playing Chumba Casino. Coincidence? I think not. Everybody's loving having fun with it. Chumba Casino is home to hundreds of casino-style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere, even at 30,000 feet. So sign up now at Chumbacasino.com to claim your free welcome bonus. That's Chumbacasino.com and live the Chumba life. No purchase necessary. BGW. Void. We're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus.